them. We have no extra room in our small chapel. The Christian brothers here are so discouraged, just like the staff and other inmates. Last week, the commissioner had a hundred of our best men shipped to Morgan County and, and southeast because they had to take psychological medicine for their deep-seated emotional problems. Yesterday, my dear brother and Sally Wesley Brown, who had lived with me for at least three years, was shipped from here away from his family who lived close by, and that will be a four-hour drive to see him. He lost his guitar, his radio, all his tapes, all of his music, because if you are sent to another prison, you lose everything but your clothes. All the whites shipped are being replaced with blacks who are in gangs. I can only ask you to pray for God to continue to move in this place just as the Jerusalem church was scattered through persecution. So these dear brothers shipped can help others. The church gathered has become the church scattered just like in Acts. I continue to play the piano, lead singing, preach on occasion, help out in Bible college and memorize Bible verses since June 1st. I have memorized all of Hebrews and 1 John the last two weeks. I memorized Psalms 103, all about the benefits and mercies of the Lord. Where would we be without His grace and His mercy? I love you, dear brother. I will miss your messages. I pray that the year 2011 will be the best year ever for Grace and Truth Ministries. You will always be a blessing. Uh, your friend and brother, Dr. Donald Mc McCary, and he is up in Pikeville, Tennessee, and that'll be enough reading there. I'll go ahead and do announcements, and then if Greg comes back, we'll record the rest of this. If not, I'll preach without recording. Remember our needy, the people that we take offerings for and we look after, we trying to help people uh, with their needs, the needy believers, so just remember them. And uh, I will, I guess we can't record this, so we'll just wait till Greg gets back, and if he gets that fixed, I'll go ahead and be preaching, and uh, are you recording? recording? Yeah, we got one speaker. We got one speaker. Oh, we got one speaker? Okay. Uh, are we on live stream huh yeah, we're okay okay we'll just say hello to everybody on live stream do we have do we have some people watching right now uh, 24 24 who's watching uh, I only know six. huh you only know six of them yeah. well hello everybody that's watching and uh, we love you guys hope you'll keep watching and uh, does, does the camera pick up with these lights out right here? Yes. yes. Well, well y'all just pretend you're, I'm on stage doing a play and you're out there <laughs> with the lights out, okay? Spirits in prison. Huh? Spirits in prison. You're in darkness. You're in darkness. <laughs> I'm going to call you to the light. Yes. For those of you that don't know uh, out there, we have some lights out here in the center. So... But remember our needy and our downtrodden people. We've got people that believe the truth, that love the truth very much. They just don't make a living. And some of them are disabled. Some of them are older and, and on disability, on SSI. Some of them are making 500 up to $1,000 a month. And then they have taxes out of that. And they're trying to pay rent in their various cost. If you were making a thousand a month then you had to pay taxes on that. It takes you down to nine hundred and then you had to pay five hundred a month rent. <laughs> Gonna be not be much left, is it? And uh, there's people that we have that are like that. So just be aware of them. And you wanna send food cards, you wanna send uh, gift cards, send them here and uh, we get them right straight to the people who are in need. And uh, just remember that. And uh, I am looking for a couple of cars right now. I'm talking about old cars, used cars, for work cars. If you got to know anybody that has one or you see one in your neighborhood and you hear about somebody's wanting to get rid of one, and if it's a good work car, uh, let me know. Uh, if we can get the right price on a couple of them, we'll buy two of them. And uh, 
I've got people in need trying, wanting to get back and forth to church and uh, wanting to get back and forth to a job. And we believe in helping the people who are believers here. So just remember these folks. Uh, well, let's, if I can see anybody out there, we'll go to the Lord in prayer now and uh, pray for the ministry, pray for me. I get pretty tired sometimes. I was really tired, just exhausted today. I don't know why today. It just, just kind of went home and slept for about two and a half hours this afternoon. Sometimes I just get wore down, and uh, it's part of this ministry. And, but I won't ever quit, never. I will preach till I'm old and wore out. I hope I preach. I said this morning, my whole goal in life is to preach and then die. I hope that I preach one Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night, and then I fall over dead. I don't want to languish in some hospital with cats are eating me up for uh, two years, you know. If God would just let me fall dead, I would appreciate that, Lord. Just let me preach and fall dead, okay? And uh, I really look forward to going to be with the Lord for for once in my life. And uh, so let's go, Lord, in prayer. It's Sunday night, and our subject is the doctrine of devils. The doctrine of devils is the doctrine of demons. There is no such thing as demons, other than the fact the demon is self. It's you and I, before God cast out devils. And the Bible says that God cast out devils with his word there in the 8th chapter of Matthew, and the scripture says in the 12th chapter of Matthew, he casts out devils by his spirit. The Holy Spirit is truth. John 14, 15, 16. John 16, 33, 1 John 5 and 6. The Bible says the spirit is the truth. And if he cast out devils by his truth, he cast out devils by the spirit he cast out by truth. The Bible says thy word is truth. Well, he says in, in Matthew the 8th chapter, he cast out devils by his word. Matthew the 8th chapter. And in Matthew the 12th chapter, he cast out devils by the spirit. And he writes the word of God upon fleshy tables of our hearts, fleshy tables of the heart. And that's when, that's when the kingdom of God is coming to us. What he does Kingdom, to make this real simple, kingdom of God, which is a term for Israel, well, when he writes upon fleshy tables of our hearts, this is when he circumcises our hearts. We're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and that's when he sheds abroad. All these are equal. The Spirit is truth. The truth is the Word. And the Spirit and the Word have been written upon fleshy tables of our heart. And we're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. And that's our hearts are circumcised. And then the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. There in the fifth chapter of Romans. Love or agape. And agape is walking in the commandments of God. 2 John 6. So all of these, all of these are the same thing. This is how God cast out devils. This is how the kingdom of God comes to us. And that's an old ancient, ancient term for Israel. And we're spiritual Israel. Spiritual Israel. Spiritual Israel. And since we're spiritual Israel, the kingdom of God comes to us when by his spirit, he 
he, which is the truth, which is the word, he writes upon tables of our hearts, circumcises our hearts, and gets sin from our hearts. And this is the love of God that shed abroad in our hearts, and that is truth. And that's when we become Christians, our spiritual Israel. And Jesus tell the Pharisees, he said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. He said, the kingdom of God is in you. So God's kingdom has been placed inside of our hearts when he casts out self. And Jesus said in Mark, the first chapter, and you say, Jim, why do you keep saying this? I keep, I don't know if you might actually believe this. If you think you've got it totally clear, then there's no need for me to ever say it again. I see things clearer and more clear every time I teach. And I see things from kind of a different perspective in my mind. I really believe that you need to have this spoken to you over and over. And as I learn different things, I will connect it together. Well, Jesus said that a demon or a demonion in the first chapter of Mark, which is the same thing, actually an unclean spirit in Mark, the first chapter is the same thing. Unclean spirit. Well, a clean spirit Clean spirit is holy spirit, isn't it? In holy, hagios means pure or single, unmixed with anything else. So the Holy Spirit is the means by which demons are cast out when he writes upon our hearts his truth. That's in an unclean spirit. That is a demon being in us. And that's what Luke, the fourth chapter says, this same man and Mark 1 says he has an unclean demon or demonion. He has an unclean spirit here. The only problem, and Jesus rebukes the man. He rebukes A-U-T-O. Auto is the word self. That O there is our, our O. It's like A-U-T-O. That O in the Greek is an omega, and it's pronounced O. Their other O is a short O. It's pronounced ah, and that's an omicron. Well, the word A-U-T-O is our word auto, which means self. Well, Jesus rebuked self, masculine, gender, singular. Now, the people said demons came in all kinds of forms. They said that they were, people in the first century said they were ancestors. They said they were gods, and they were actually their ancestors that they identified as gods. And they said those ancestors would come down and get inside of their bodies, and it would lead them to good fortune or bad fortune, and that has even permeated our society because we see that everywhere in our society. There's good demons and bad demons, good gods and bad gods. You see it in cartoons. You see the little, the little imp on one shoulder whispering in the Bugs Bunny's ear to do something to Yosemite Sam. And you see the little angel with the halo, which is a sun god behind his head on the other shoulder, whispering in your ear to do good. No, no, don't throw him down that shaft. And this is saying, throw him down the shaft. That's the good and the evil demon that they said they had in the first century. Call them good and evil demons. It amazes me William Shatner come on with that Priceline commercial, and, and he's got the evil demon. He's got the heavy beard, the black beard, and he's got beard, and he breaks through the wall. Uh, he comes through the wall with his hair not darkened. He's in there tempting the person. That's the bad demon, and the good demon is... Uh, where he breaks through the wall and you don't have the dye on his beard in that other picture. And that's just nothing but a bleeding over of the ancient world believing in good demons and bad demons. And they said these demons will lead you to good fortune. Well, the Bible says that in the latter times, many will depart from the faith or some shall depart from the faith. The faith, there is one faith, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's not a faith that you have, that you get strong in, that you can have stuff. I believe you're going to give me a car, and I believe you're going to, make, Lord, you're going to help me to make $45 an hour, and, and oh, Lord, make that $50 an hour. And God, I believe you're going to give me a new house, and, and I believe it, and that's my faith. Amen. That's not faith. That's wishing. Faith is dying to self. It's death to self. It believes God and doesn't believe self. That's what faith is, and faith works, and faith uh, there's many things about faith that we've studied. 
But men will depart from faith. They'll depart from daily dying. They'll t depart from the daily cross. Because faith is a daily cross. The Bible says that faith is substance. Substance means to understand. Understand. If you understand, you are a disciple because a disciple is a learner. That's the word mathetes. And you cannot be my disciple, my disciple, if you do not bear your cross and die daily. So faith is understanding. That's learning by a daily cross. So faith is daily cross so men will depart from this daily cross and what is it they'll depart from they'll depart from truth if you tell the truth that's where you get a daily cross but men hate the cross of christ paul said they hate this daily cross because their god is their belly and they mind earthly things mind is the word phroneo p-h-r-o-n-e-o -E it means their their feeling their sentiment their sentiment, their feelings, their desires are on earthly. The word is gay, G-E. It means soil. And everything that you can see, everything you see, no matter what it is, is made of soil or dirt. The tables come out of the ground. Either the metal was in the ground, the wood was in the ground in this building, uh, everything that you can see, your bodies are made out of dirt, your car is dirt, your house is dirt, everything's dirt. And men like to decorate their dirt bodies with dirt. They like diamond rings and dying, like the old country song. Uh, I'm just an old chunk of coal and I'm going to be a diamond someday. Well, that's all that, that's all a diamond is, is coal under pressure for a long time and coal is dirt. So people like dirt and everything is made up of the same thing there's no such thing as dung atoms and diamond atoms atoms are atoms and everything in the universe is made up of atoms and all matter is made up of atoms it just depends on how they're connected as whether they're cow dung or a diamond ring on your finger and that's the truth it's all the same stuff no matter what you see and matter does not dissipate it may take on a new form. If you set a building on fire and the fire burns up the building, you'll end up with a residue and you'll end up with some gases in the air. But it's still the same as it was before. Just a chemical reaction has taken place and transmitted it into some other matter. But it, the matter is still there. You, you don't reduce matter in the universe. There's a constant state of matter. It's all the same. It's all the same stuff, and you can change the matter. You can burn a man's body, but he's still there in a different form. New York City, when you look at the New York City skyline, when you see it, you've been up there, you can see it, just all these buildings. The New York City skyline was here a million years ago. It was just in the ground. Every bit of that matter was here a million years ago. They didn't increase matter because they dug it out of the ground, built buildings out of it, and big long girders and steel girders. So what men like? If men like dirt and they like material things, what they don't like is spiritual things. They don't want to be spiritual and be told they need to be involved in truth. And we've said that when you tell the truth, men will put you on a cross when you tell them a Christmas is pagan and Easter's pagan. Now, when men, when men depart from faith, they depart from all of this. They depart from a daily cross. They depart from learning. They depart from understanding, substance, understand. They depart from all of this in order to go after soil or dirt. They don't want the cross. They like self. When the Bible says, some shall depart from the faith in the last days, and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The word is daemon. That word daemonion means to distribute fortunes. What is it you distribute practically? What is it you distribute in practicality? You distribute dirt. When you give a man, when a man accomplishes a lots of dirt, he accomplishes houses, buildings, cars, investments, IRAs, uh, everything you can think of, some chalet out in Gatlinburg or over in France, 
and properties everywhere, and it's all dirt that he's accomplished. These, if a man gain the whole world and lose his own soul, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And what has he profited? What has it profited a man to gain the whole world? Gaining the world is no big thing. You, you go to old folks that are on the verge of eternity, like Milton back there. He's not greatly concerned about stuff. He doesn't want to trade what he's got spiritually for all the money in the world because it's not going to be his very long. In fact, you take the richest men in the world, you take uh, the richest men in America, I guess uh, Bill Gates and, and uh, Warren Buffett would probably consider the two richest men in America, and they're worth $60, $65 billion. We're talking about $65,000 million. They have made a million dollars 60 or 65,000 times, and you can't even do it once. And they've made that much money that many times. Bill Gates is a very wicked man. If you look him up on the Internet, he cusses, he carries on. Uh, he was asked when I uh, looked him up on the Internet, he was asked if he stole something from Apple or one of the computer systems. He said, yeah, I stole it. You know, that's too bad. They can't look out for themselves. The man doesn't care about anything. He had talked about how he was sitting at this, this table in a restaurant and he was cussing to this using all this filthy, vulgar language. Well, he gets to keep his money, his $60, $65 billion. He gets to keep it, if he's 55, 58 years old, he gets to keep it another 20 or 25 years, and then he has to go to hell. That He's not interested in spiritual things, and neither is Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett is a very wicked, evil, godless man. You can take these men, uh, what's his name, that owns all the newspapers and all the magazines, Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch is, they said he had 58,000 employees all over the world. I can't imagine 58,000 people working for a man. He is an evil, wicked man. He's going to hell one day. People say, Jim Brown, you can't say these people are going to hell. Certainly you can. You judge righteous judgment. If you don't see a daily cross in their life, death to self, self-denial, if you don't see him being hated by the world and everybody wants to polish them up, and brush up to them, hoping that they'll get a piece of their action. They're wicked, evil, godless men. Woe unto you rich. Woe to you that are rich. You have your consolation, and they have their consolation. They don't have a daily cross. They don't talk about the Jesus of the Bible. And people say, well, maybe they got saved one time. There's no such thing as get saved one time. Now, we're talking about these men who preach the doctrine of the devil. The reason John Hagee preaches the doctrine of the devil, he wants to be rich. But he's only going to be rich for a very short time. The only reason Billy Graham preaches the doctrine of self is he wants the recognition. He wants all this dirt. He wants dirt recognition. He wants men to like him. And men do like Billy Graham. He's the most popular preacher that's lived in the last 2,000 years. That is an indictment against him. The Bible says, warn you when all men speak well of you. That is a cry of damnation. If all men speak well of you and they vote for you, you are in trouble with God. And he's, he's without a doubt the most popular, consistently popular man in America in the last hundred years. There's no doubt about that. He's on top of the polls every year. He's either one, two, three, four, somewhere in the top ten, and a lot of times in the top two or three, and sometimes he's number one, and this has been going on since the 40s. Billy Graham is a liar. People really get mad at that. I have people that just go into a rage when I say Billy Graham's a liar. He puts his approval on men who do not believe in the Trinity. He has them on his platform, men who do not believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. He puts his approval on men, like this guy Templeton who gave him an award, who says that Jesus was the son of a blonde-headed soldier and that he was... Uh, uh, that he was illegitimate child and he has this man on his platform and he accepts awards from him. He puts his approval on the Unitarians. The Unitarians say that it's okay to have, to have uh, lesbian ministers, homosexual ministers, that, that you can be gay and be a preacher, that he puts his approval on people that say that you can be saved and be, a, and be in homosexuality. 
do I believe homosexuality is worse than other sins? The Bible doesn't teach that. Homosexuality is a presumptuous sin. It's a proud sin. It stands in the light of God and proudly exudes itself and says, I'm a homosexual and this is an alternate lifestyle. It is not an alternate lifestyle any more than being an adulterer is an alternate lifestyle, any more than being a bank robber is an alternate lifestyle. It is a planned sin is what it is. You say, why are people that way? Well, I believe for various reasons. I believe, first of all, they were born that way. But guess what? I believe you were born that way. You mean, Jim, I was born a homosexual? No. You were born with a sinful nature where there's, and when you came to the age of accountability and responsibility, you went directly to sin because none seeks after God. And when nobody seeks after God, what you did you did just like druggies do. You went out and picked the sin that you like best. Some people say, I like to club, and I like to nightclub, and I like to go out there dancing and drinking, and I like to chase women. Some guys say, I like to dance and drink, and I like to go chase men. Some guys say, I like drugs. I just love to be drugged out of my mind. That's, it's the sin of choice. I've had men come here and say, I've heard guys sit around and say, well, I really like cocaine. Oh, you did? Well, my drug of choice was crack. I like crack. Well, it's a bad thing, you know. Uh, well, I like pot. Well, I like this. And everybody has a drug of choice, and homosexuality is a sin of choice. What makes people do that? Well, they say, well, I'm not getting along with women. I uh, never found a woman that lives up to my mother. A lot of it has been. A lot of it is, is women that maybe they're, they're sons. I know this for a fact. My uncle was the most flaming homosexual I have ever seen in my life. He makes all the other homosexuals you've ever seen look like he-man. I mean, <laughs> he prissed everywhere. And he just let me have one of those cookies. This is so delicious. And you're going, wow, Uncle Sonny is, he's strange, isn't he? And we'd, and it, we'd say, Uncle Sonny's over at the house, and he's so funny. He's putting on Grandma's clothes and parading around the house. We didn't know what a transvestite was in 1950, but my grandmother babied him and babied him and let him have his way, and I just don't believe he ever thought there was any women could live up to his mother, and they would, and he'd go out and steal and come to his mother, and she'd say, those mean old policemen ain't going to hurt my baby. And I believe a lot of this is the way children are raised. I believe what happens is you have the natural propensity, wherever that means. <laughs> that means a leaning toward. You have a natural propensity for sin, and you go out and you pick out the sin of choice. And being a homosexual is not any different than being a bank robber or being an adulterer. You just like to try that and fulfill the flesh doing that instead of one of these other sins. But it's all sin, and if God doesn't deal with a man's heart, people say, and some will say, but I don't want to give up men. I, I like men. I've had men call me and say, Pastor Brown, I like men. I'm homosexual. I want to serve God. I love the message you preach. What am I going to do? It's like any other thing you have to give up. It takes crucifying self. I just like women. I'm just weak. You're not weak. You have no guts to come up to yourself and say, hey, you stop that. You have, it takes, certainly it takes God, but it takes like anything else you stop doing. That's like, I said this morning, if you stop eating sugar for about three weeks, you won't want it anymore. Stop eating cakes and pies, you get to where you don't have a taste for it, you get a taste for fruit and vegetables. It's the same thing as giving up eating pie and cake, when you just love pie and cake. You have to force yourself to do what's right. I don't care what sin it is. You like to chase women and carouse and carry on, and I'm just weak, I'm just over sex. No, you're not. You're like any other man. You just don't have any perseverance. You, have, you just don't care, and it boils down to this. How much do you care about God? You have to make yourself do right, and that's what the Bible teaches us, and you won't do that until God deals with you. Now, 
these guys, I have gone through a whole bunch of these guys. Billy Graham, he puts his approval on everything and everybody. He's got all these friends, and I've been reading out of this book, Billy Graham and his friends. I don't know if I'm going to read anything out of it, but it's, it's about all these men that he has on his platform. He talks about what good Christians they are. You can go through here, and it, the title of this is Billy Graham and his friends. And it have these sections about the wolf scattering the flock, Henry Luce, a politician, Governor Strom Thurmond. These are all friends of Billy Graham. John Foster Dulles, I remember him. He was Secretary of State during Eisenhower's administration. Uh, she, this woman gets into some things I'm not really particularly... I'm not interested in whether somebody's a communist or not. Uh, that's not the problem. The problem is false doctrine. Bernard Baruch, uh, uh, approved of by Billy Graham, Churchill. These are all men who have William Randolph Hearst. Of course, Hearst built Billy Graham. He was a Roman Catholic publisher. Uh, let me read this to you right here. Billy Graham asserts, that he doesn't know why Hearst gave him publicity since he claims that he and Hearst never met. But earlier in his autobiography, he admitted that Wesley Herzl, a Hearst newspaperman, traveled with youth for Christ and Graham to Great Britain, a prophet with honor, which Graham asked William Martin to write, says basically the same thing. Now, he asked this William Martin to write this biography, A Prophet with Honor, and uh, someone found that for me and brought it to me, and that is an outrageous title for a book. The Bible says in Mark, the sixth chapter, a prophet is not without honor except among his own country and among his own kindred. You don't have any honor when you're at home. Well, he shouldn't have any honor in the United States, but he is honored by everyone, and he likes everybody, and everybody likes him. And he says that uh, Graham asked William Herschel to write this book, Listen to his story, he said, that Tory Johnson, Graham, and a few others were accompanied by William Herzl, a reporter for William Randolph Hearst's Chicago Herald American. Herzl was assigned to this trip on an editor's inspired hunch that Graham might turn out to be a top newsmaker. That's why Hearst went after him, and he liked him. He didn't offend William Randolph Hearst, the Roman Catholic publisher, and he owned dozens of newspapers across America. Hearst had already shown considerable interest in the Youth for Christ, apparently because he liked its patriotic emphasis, and he liked the morality of it. It wasn't that he believed in anything Christian and felt its moral standards might help combat juvenile delinquency. Not incidentally, he also figured that any movement attracting nearly a million people to rallies every Saturday night might help him sell some newspapers. And there wasn't enough in Billy Graham's messages when he was with the Youth for Christ as a young man in the 40s to convict William Randolph Hearst. According to Johnson, who never had any direct contact with Hearst, the reclusive publisher sent his Chicago editor a telegram shortly after the Soldier Field rally. It contained two words, Puff Graham, or Puff YFC, Youth for Christ. A short time later, all 22 Hearst papers carried a full-page story on the YFC movement. Further coverage followed, and other papers picked up the story as the old titan Hearst watched this organization grow. He apparently realized that Graham and Templeton were its two brightest stars, and Templeton doesn't even believe in the deity of Christ or the virgin birth. And Billy Graham gets awards from Mr. Templeton's organization and decided to assign someone to chronicle their ascent. Herzl's reports of, British, of the British trip appeared not only to the Hearst papers, but the International News Service Wire uh, significance in newspapers in America. And he goes on and on with this story. Uh, and William Randolph Hearst gave... Uh, in 1984, gave $10,000 to Planned Parenthood, and they're behind the abortion issue more than anybody else. And he goes into Norman Vincent Peale. Billy Graham says Norman Vincent Peale was one of the greatest Christians he knew, and Norman Vincent Peale didn't even believe in a new birth. 
He says he got saved, but he doesn't use those terminology. He don't use the terminology born again. That's what Norman Vincent Peale says. And Graham wonders if he's pleasing man or God. And uh, then you find in this book, they're saying that every time a president gets shot or gets hurt or has a major problem or there's some attempt on his life, they call Billy Graham in and whatever he advises them, that's what he does. And he's friends with all the presidents. He was asked if he like, got along with all the presidents. He said, oh, yes, I love them all. The Bible doesn't say love the Caesars. The Bible doesn't say we're supposed to like these people. And then it goes into all of these. He likes so many people. It's unbelievable. I've marked so much in here. And he even puts his approval on same-sex unions. He puts his approval on men. He'll approve of a man. Won't even, evidently, if he does investigate the man, he doesn't, he doesn't have any qualms about putting his approval on people who believe in same-sex unions. In other words, men marrying men or living with men. And he puts his approval on people who believe in summoning up the dead or talking to the dead or necromancy. He has them on his platforms. Gosh, there's so much here. Reinhold Niebuhr. Another individual at Union Theological Seminary was Reinhold Niebuhr. He was professor of applied Christianity, the dean of UTS from 1950 to 55, and the vice president from 55 to 60. Needless to say, Niebuhr was an active member of the Socialist Party, which I don't care about that part. He wrote articles for The Nation and The World Tomorrow. He also supported the socialist Norman Thompson Thomas in his campaign for the presidency in 1932. And he goes through all of this with this guy Niebuhr. And Niebuhr is just an out-and-out -out atheist. And Billy Graham calls him a good Christian man. I don't know how in the world you get Christian out of an atheist, do you? He goes into all of these people that are subversive to the government. Goes into this E.V. Hill who used to be on, on TBN all the time. And E.V. Hill endorses everything that's wrong. Of course, he's dead now. But he endorsed everything. 1984, E.V. Hill endorsed Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson doesn't care about the black community. Jesse Jackson is not even a black man. I don't know who told it, the world that. He's as white as you can be, isn't he? He's not saying, I'm going to go over here and live in the ghetto with the blacks. He's up there playing footsie and playing politics with the white establishment. E.V. Hill endorsed Jesse Jackson for Democratic nomination for president. He, also, he was also a speaker at Billy Graham's Amsterdam 83 conference and was listed as a speaker for Billy Graham in 1992 in Wheaton, Illinois. Additionally, he is on the board of directors of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Well, he's not anymore. He died. And it goes all through here, and he is also a member of the board of directors in the National Council of Churches, which does not believe in the virgin birth of Christ or the inerrancy of Scripture or that Jesus was divine, that he was God. And Billy Graham says these are some of the best Christian men he knows. I can't believe this. Just unbelievable. E.V. Hill said, E.V. Hill sounds like a typical Baptist preacher. And he, he would go to TBN... And he would intermix with them. He may not have been a tongue speaker, but he'd sit there while they spoke in tongues and he'd just put his approval on everything that they were doing. You can't mix with that. If anybody preaches any other doctrine, you withdraw from them. You have no fellowship with them. You don't bid them God's speed. You say, he looks like a pretty good Baptist preacher to me. He's not. Because he goes up there, before he died, he went up there and mixed with all that, those lies. And he didn't believe in predestination. He didn't believe in a daily cross and death to self. He just preached real hard like this. What does that mean? Don't mean nothing. My father preached like that. My father didn't know any truth. You say, well, he sounded like a good Baptist. Don't be fooled by what a man sounds like. If there's no truth coming out of his mouth, that doesn't mean a thing. I used to watch E.B. Hill on there. I said, this man is ridiculous. Sitting there putting his approval on Paul and Jan Crouch and old purple hair, and she's sitting there with her hair purple as can be, and he's, he's sitting there, yeah, Jan, you know, and I did this and I did that, and praise God for your ministry, and he'd sit there and brag on these bunch of liars. People who put their approval, the Bible says they're protector of their evil deeds. You say, Jim, don't you like anybody? Not hardly. <laughs>
I don't know of a preacher out there that I believe has got guts enough to stand up and say the truth is the truth, and if you don't believe it, get out of my life. I have never been so tired of... Yeah, most people like John Hagee because she talks like a Baptist preacher, but he's a full-blown charismatic. He says if you're poor, you're stupid, and you're dumb, and that's your fault. Because you can be rich, just believe it. A little bit about E.V. Hill. Below is an eyewitness account of someone who attended the North American Congress on the Holy Spirit and World Evangelism in 1987 where E.V. Hill was also a speaker, he reports. Now consider this. E.V. Hill sat for about two and a half hours before he actually got up to speak. What did he see and hear at this conference? He listened to loud babble of tongues. There's no such thing as tongues. That's false doctrine. During the worship time, an unspeakable, confusing time of holy shouting, he heard rock music as loud as secular rock concert, watching the girls dancing of the drama teams, heard prophecies which were delivered in the first person as from Jesus Christ himself, heard a woman, Roman Catholic, preach about growing in the fullness of salvation and halos and icons in St. Xavier, watched Catholic Kevin Ranigan and Pentecostal Vincent Sinan hug each other twice and speak of how wonderful it is for Catholics and Pentecostals finally to get together. And the Roman Catholics believe you have to eat Jesus to go to heaven. And you've got to be a Catholic to do it. And they don't believe according to their doctrines, according to their catechism, you can go without being a Roman Catholic. That's in their catechism, every one of them. I've had Catholics call me and say, my priest don't teach that. Well, then your priest is not telling you Roman Catholic catechism and Roman Catholic doctrine. It's true. For more than two hours, Hill looked over, look out over a crowd of 35,000, half of what were Catholics. After this experience, E.B. Hill walked up to the podium and said what? What should a man say after experiencing such things? A man who claims to be a fundamental Bible believer, a man who speaks in fundamental Baptist churches, if he were a prophet of God, he would have plenty to say, and it wouldn't have been music to the ears of those creating this doctrinal confusion. But what did he say? Here's what Hill said. Hill stood for a moment, calmly looking about, then said, Wow, if you're not on fire by now, your wood is wet. What a stupid thing. First of all, that's an old dumb joke from a thousand years ago. If your bell isn't ringing, your clapper is broken. Who cares about that? That ain't, no, that's, ain't an ounce of truth in that. No wonder Jerry Huffman could state that left-wing social action promoter Hill apparently has never seen an ecumenical forum he didn't like. Ecumenical means let's all come together into one. And Billy Graham is the leader of ecumenism in America. That means everybody get together. If you can say Jesus with your lips, then you must be going to heaven. No, you're not. There's another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. All the charismatics preach that other Jesus. I don't know what happened to E.V. Hill when he died. But he seemed like such a nice guy. Do you think God is looking for nice guys to go to heaven? He's looking for people who stand for truth and be hated for it. No daily cross. He didn't. You think if I sat and listened to that, I would only sit and listen to that with all those TBN people if they would let me preach after it. And then they'd have to put a hook on me and drag me off the stage. I'd say, you bunch of evil, wicked, godless people. But you have to be willing to say the truth. And if a man's not willing to say it and correct all those lies... That's all that goes on at the Devil's Broadcasting Network, DBN. It's just lies. You gospel singers, you get on TV and you sing on Bill Gaither's gospel singing, you sing these high notes and you sing all these pretty harmonies and you don't know nothing about the truth and there's not a word of truth in those songs. There's no daily cross, no depth to self, no self-denial, no predestination. There's no limiting God's grace to his elect family in your songs. There's no few finding the narrow gate. There's no being hated by the world in your gospel songs. I hate gospel music. It's not gospel. That's so stupid. Call it gospel entertainment. The gospel is the resurrection. Resurrection is coming to life after dying. You mean dying daily is entertainment? Gospel entertainment is a lie. Bunch of fools. Watch. I sit 
sometimes I'll be flipping through the TV and there'll be Bill Gaither and his infomercials. He's making millions and you gospel singers are getting pennies and you're helping him to get rich. Did you know that? And he doesn't know an ounce of truth. Got a bunch of old heathens there. Nobody ever gives a testimony on the gospel singings. I knew those guys. Cuss like sailors. Tell dirty jokes. Drank. Don't tell me about that. I know what that's about. I don't like gospel music and gospel singers. Sometimes I watch it, I'm going, I look at it and I'm enamored by the idiocy of it. I listen to the songs and then they're saying, God is an awesome God, praise God. You can't praise God as long as you have any praise for yourself. You can only praise God if you believe God is doing all things. In everything, give thanks or praise God for everything. What does that mean? That means for car wrecks. That means for cancer. That means regardless of what it is, it all works together for the good of the elect. I don't like gospel singers. I don't like any of these preachers. Well, don't you like anybody? I love Thomas Watson, but he died 300 years ago. I love Jonathan Edwards, but he died 300 years ago. These dead guys that live in my library... These men who believe in the sovereignty of God and predestination. But they're going to call those of us who believe those things, well, you're just a nut and you're a fanatic. That's right. Well, I don't like those people. He goes through here. I'm just kind of thumbing through this. This, uh, he honors these humanists of the year. He puts his approval on this man. Huxley, who's one of the founders of this UNESCO, which is a world organization. It, it, let me read Niebuhr, who is a pagan, who Billy Graham puts his approval on, was co-founder of UNESCO. UNESCO is an organization trying to influence our children to accept a world government. Julian Huxley, former director of UNESCO in 1962, Humanist of the Year, was an atheistic philosopher, a member of the Communist Colonial Bureau of the British Fabian Society and a signer of the Humanist Manifesto II in its education program, UNESCO, can stress the ultimate needs for world political unity. That's everybody coming together, believing the same thing and getting along and being happy and getting in one big pile and having a big hug fest. We are supposed to separate from the world that walks disorderly. Billy Graham puts his approval on everybody. If you know how to say J-E-S-U-S, see, I can spell Jesus, I'm a Hindu. Well, then you're going to heaven. Good night. And this Huxley, the founder of UNESCO, he believes that we need to, throughout the world, make contraceptives available to minors. And Billy Graham approves of this man. It's... I'm not reading all of this because there's too much to it. <coughs> How does Billy Graham feel about Reinhold Niebuhr, who is, who is a friend of this Huxley and who is a, he's a humanist and he is an atheistic philosopher? Here's what Billy Graham feels about Niebuhr. In Graham's book, The Evangelism and the Church Today, he writes, the great theologians of today are Rudolf Bultmann, Karl Barth, Emil Brunner, Reinhold Niebuhr, who puts his approval on getting contraceptives to minors in the world who doesn't believe in the divinity of Christ, and he is a heathen. And Billy Graham says he's one of the great theologians of today. How? How? And people, I had a woman call me one, that book you're reading is a lie. Forget the book. Go online, look up, is Billy Graham a Mason? Just look that up. Just Google it. And Google Billy Graham false teacher. What you'll get is sound bites of Billy Graham talking to, even short interviews, Billy Graham talking to uh, Robert Schuler. You'll get Billy Graham talking to Larry King, just no guts, no stand, putting his approval on everything. And you can go online and you can watch Billy Graham say, you can watch him say to Robert Schuller, he says, I believe that people from all religions are going to be believers, Hindus, 
Buddhists, Catholics, whether they ever hear the name of Jesus or not, or whether they ever know about Jesus, he says they can be saved, and they're going to be saved in their religions where they were founded if they go out and do the good works of Christ in those religions, even though they're not born again. Billy Graham says they're going to heaven. He says that to Robert Schuller, and Robert Schuller says, I'm so glad to hear you say that, Dr. Graham. He's not a doctor, neither are you, you imbecile. Can't cure anybody. You can go online, forget the book. This woman is a doctor that wrote this book, Dr. Kathy Burns. This is all documented. I've heard Billy Graham say a lot of these same things myself. He is the most beloved man in America consistently. More than any president, more than any preacher, he's the most famous preacher that has ever lived the most well-loved and liked preacher. Pat Boone says he's the greatest man that ever lived. You're an idiot, Pat. First of all, anybody who will say one man's garbage is another man's doctrine and vice versa. Pat Boone needs to go back to the beach and to his love letters in the sand. He needs to forget being a preacher. The guy's an idiot. I mean, anybody who will come back at 60 years old and put on leather and try to be a heavy metal put out a heavy metal song. Uh, I can just see him singing uh, Metallica. Huh? Metallica, singing Metallica. Or singing, the only one I know is, is Van Halen singing, Go ahead and jump. <laughs> Can't you just see that? Go ahead and jump. What an idiot. Pat Boone is... He is a lame brain. He don't have sense to walk in out of the rain. Probably know if it is raining. John Southern and Bonnell, Stan Moody Hand, condom distribution. There's a section on that. Billy Graham puts his approval on these people who do this. Spiritual United Nations, psychic phenomena. He puts his approval on people who do that. The WCC and the NCC, the World Council of Churches, National Council of Churches, any fundamentalist group or actually people who claim to believe in the fundamentals of the faith, they don't want nothing to do with the World Council of Churches or the National Council of Churches. They don't believe in the virgin birth. They don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. They do not believe that Jesus is divine. They don't believe he's God in the flesh. A lot of these people with the WCC and the NCC, the National Council of Churches, believe that Jesus is an illegitimate child of a German soldier. And Billy Graham says this is a great group of some of the best Christians I know. People think if you can shout and speak in tongues and jump up and down, and he goes into Harry Emerson Fosdick, who is one of the former pastors at Riverside Church in New York, and how that they don't believe in the virgin birth, and he goes into, gosh, atheists in heaven. Atheist in heaven. Archbishop Ramsey was the former president of the World Council of Churches, he commented, and Billy Graham puts his approval on the World Council of the Churches, says these are some of the best Christians I know. You see, I'm familiar with the NCC and the WCC. Ever since I was a little kid, my father and his friends, they cussed the World Council of Churches, being a bunch of fundamentalist Baptists, and they cussed the NCC, the National Council of Churches, and I heard these things when I was a little boy in the early 50s that the WCC and the NCC did not believe in the virgin birth of Christ and the deity of Christ and the inerrancy of Scripture. They've been saying that for a long time. And Billy Graham is approves of these people. Has them on his platform. In fact, I remember the Baptist I was raised around in the early 50s. Boy, they were just, they were livid against Billy Graham. And he, Billy Graham was drawing crowds of 130, 40, 50,000 in 1952 and 53. He had to have stadiums back then. A Coliseum wouldn't do it. He's been drawing the biggest crowds in history. He's 92 and he's about to die and he has no conviction about what he's done. Archbishop Ramsey was a former president of the World Council of Churches. Is anybody familiar with the World Council of Churches? WCC, this is the higher echelon 
of extreme modernists. The American Baptist Convention is in the north. You have the Southern Baptist Convention in the south. The largest Protestant denomination in America is the Southern Baptist Convention. That's the largest. The American Baptist Convention and the Northern Baptist Convention are extremely liberal. They have all these preachers that do not believe in the virgin birth. They have all these preachers that do not believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, and they do not believe in these basic tenets of the faith. Most of those guys are members of the World Council of Churches or the National Council of Churches, and Billy Graham approves of these people and has them on his platform. Archbishop Ramsey, one of Billy Graham's friends, was a former president of the World Council of Churches, he commented, I can foresee the day when all Christians might accept the Pope as bishop of the world church. He also denied the virgin birth in the London Daily Mail, February 10th, 1961. Ramsey said, heaven is not a place for Christians only. I expect to see many present-day atheists there. And Billy Graham, this is one of his friends. Another source gives this quote from Ramsey. Here's another quote. Those who led a good life on earth but found themselves unable to believe in God will not be debarred. I expect to meet the present-day atheists in heaven. This is one of Billy Graham's friends. The Bible, however, says that without faith it's impossible to please God. In 1966, Ramsey had an audience with Pope Paul the sixth at the Vatican he addressed the Pope as your holiness and expressed his desire for closer unity with Rome that is completely against the Bible don't have any fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness rebuke them Billy Graham says the Pope is one of his best friends he says the Pope now we have a man in the world that the world can look up to when we look up to the Pope the Pope preaches Catholicism, preaches you have to eat of the Eucharist, which has the body and blood of Christ literally in it. He preaches cannibalism and says you can't go to heaven without eating of the Eucharist. That is the Roman Catholic Mass. And Billy Graham says, oh yeah, but they don't mean that. They're Christians too. You know the difference? They believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but they don't believe they have to die daily and resurrect in Christ daily. As Ramsey and the other Anglican clergy were departing, they bowed and kissed the Pope's ring. Speaking about this papal visit a year later, Ramsey testified that he and the Pope walked arm in arm out in St. Peter's Basilica and dedicated themselves to the task of unifying all Christendom and all churches of all the world into one church. And this is one of Billy Graham's buddies and friends. In November 1968, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Michael Ramsey, said in London, it is the dealings of man with his neighbors that we shall find transcendence. We must join hands with humanists, atheists, and agnostics in the service of mankind. Oh, is that so? The Bible says we're not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. In September 1970, the WCC World Council of Churches decided to don donate $200,000 to guerrilla organizations sending terrorists into Rhodesia, Angola, Mozambique, and South Africa. You say, Jim, what does all this have to do? It has to do with Billy Graham approves. He is a, he's in politics. He advises these big world leaders, puts his approval on all these people. He says, well, I may not agree with their theology, but I love them as brothers. The decision was taken up at a meeting in London at which the co-chairman was Dr. Ramsey, late Archbishop of Canterbury. In the same year, the WCC, World Council of Churches, decided to give 70000 annually for three years, helping American draft dodgers escape from the U.S. into Canada. In spite of such actions and comments, Billy Graham calls Ramsey a giant of a man and added, we were friends for many years. Friends with the world are enemies of God. If you have an affection for this Ramsey, this WCC, guy, this man who doesn't believe in the deity of Christ, you're partaker of his evil deeds, Billy, and you're partaker of his judgments. I would be terrified to be Billy Graham at 92 years old. I'm going to go into eternity. As president of the World Council of Churches, 1946 to 54, he was a vigorous proponent of ecumenism. In 1960, he traveled to meet the Orthodox Patriarchs of Jerusalem and Constantinople, 
Do y'all realize all this goes on behind the scenes? This is, and people will get mad at me. Mostly middle-aged ladies call, you can't talk about a wonderful man of God that way. Woman, you are ignorant. This man is not a wonderful man of God. He approves of everything. I don't approve hardly anything. Not even my own sin. He traveled to meet with these archbishops. He also visited Pope, Pope, Pope John the 23rd, becoming the first archbishop of Canterbury to visit the Vatican. And Billy Graham sees he's a great, wonderful man. A member of the WCC staff, Stanley Samartha, announced in 1971, because Christians cannot claim to have a monopoly of truth, we need to meet men of other faiths and ideologies as part of our trust and obedience to the promise of Christ. Dr. David Gill, a representative of the World Council of Churches, told the British Broadcasting Corporation that the most important aim of the WCC for 1974 would be to deprotestantize the churches. Folks, do you know how we're going to have a world order and a one world religion? These guys are going to succeed before it's over with. When our nation crashes and the economy goes down, they're going to be saying, look, you can believe what you want, but you can't say it out loud that if you put down another man's religion. They've already got it in practice in the fair doctrine, the fairness doctrine. The fairness doctrine in most of the countries of the world says you can't preach against homosexuals. You can't preach against another man's religion. I couldn't preach against Kenneth Copeland. I couldn't preach against T.D. Jackson. I couldn't preach against these preachers that don't believe in the daily cross or death to self or self-denial or being aided by the world. I cannot say anything against them under the fairness doctrine. They'll come up and say, we'll all have one religion you can hold hands with the Buddhists. The Buddhists can hold hands with the Hindus. This is how we're going to have a world religion. This will be the holler to Babylon. They're not going to let me do this permanently. I don't know if anybody's that got the guts to do what I'm doing. I wonder if there's people downstairs in my house at night waiting to break in my house and kill me and Mary. Sometimes I'm real careful going downstairs. I lock the doors going downstairs. I don't know. Are you afraid? No, I just, I want to stay here as long as I can for the church. I'm saying some things that are so hard that I wouldn't be surprised someday if somebody shoots me for it. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody breaks in, comes in the door while I'm preaching. I'll have to grab some pulpit up. I'll probably have a rush of adrenaline and I'll be able to do that. I think about the, I think about these kind of things all the time. When you preach what I preach, Christmas is pagan, and Christmas has to do with the swastika, and the swastika is the Big Dipper, and that's what the Masons are into, and that's all the fireworks. I mean, you say, if you say these things unabashedly and you're not afraid to say it, somebody's going to get mad before it's over with. You know that? But you know what? I am so tired, I don't really care. You have to come to that place. You have to not care. I am sick of Billy Graham. I'm fed up with him. Puts his approval on everything. I can't even get through this book. Arnold Toynbee, representative of the World Council of the Churches. <laughs> they even got witches in their totem pole in here that Billy Graham puts his approval on. I'm just thumbing through. I mean, just it's crazy. I don't know. Abortion and homosexuality, Billy Graham puts his approval on that. He puts his approval on people who approve of it. He puts his approval on... Just about anything you want to. It's got a section on the Skull and Bones in here. And the Skull and Bones is a secret organization that all the presidents belong to. And they have to lay down in a casket naked with, for their initiating ceremony. And that's heathenism, isn't it? They've got this Ned. Uh, oh, goodness. I've, it's so much in here. This guy, what's his name, Ned something here. And he is uh, extreme liberal. And they're talking about him and how proud they are of him. And he don't believe in truths. He, they, he goes into Peter Lowe and his organization. This is a friend of Billy Graham's. It includes Margaret Thatcher, Ozzy Smith, Bob Costas, William Bennett, Jack Gropel. Paul Harvey, Zig Ziglar, Tom Hopkins. I know who Zig Ziglar and Tom Hopkins are. They're motivational speakers and they're idiots. I'm telling you, you can be rich and famous like them. Goes into Muhammad Ali, Christopher Reeve. They were all, these were all his friends. Barbara Bush, Larry King, Henry Kissinger. 
Let me just read this. I, I can't believe the stuff, but it's documented. And people, well, how many friends do you think a liberal blind preacher like Billy Graham can make in 92 years when all the world likes him and pulls him into their system? All the presidents, all the politicians, all of the people in Hollywood and Las Vegas like him. At his birthday, and they had all these Las Vegas performers taking time off from their stage shows and drinking and going back in their dressing rooms with women so they could stop and look at a camera and wishing happy birthday. I, I, now, wait a minute, honey. Let me, I'll be back there in a minute. Okay, happy birthday, Dr. Graham. I just, it's astounding. And people don't want to believe this. All you have to do is go online, go on the Internet, Google all this. And talking about Billy Graham wants to rewrite the Ten Commandments by accepting certain things. I can't get to all this. It's just too much. Let me set this over here. These preachers are preaching. Let me give you another false teacher. Another false teacher is Arnold Murray. Arnold Murray lives high. They drive big, fancy Mercedes. I had a lady over there that lived over there in Gravit, Arkansas, and she said they live like kings over here. They won't hardly talk to you when you come through town. And Arnold Murray gets on TV, sits down at a desk, and people think because he uses words out of a Greek concordance, he is a teacher of truth. And I've had people say, you remind me of Arnold Murray. Well, don't you say that because Arnold Murray ain't nothing like me. Arnold Murray bought him a concordance years ago, and all he uses is a concordance, but he'll read eight or ten scriptures and give you a word, and there's nothing in the word the way he defines it that means anything. He usually doesn't know what he's talking about, and he has so much false doctrine. Let me read you some stuff on Arnold Murray. He is a false teacher. The history of Arnold Murray in the Shepherd's Chapel. You've seen him on TV, haven't you? Never seen Arnold Murray? People think he's this great Bible teacher. Has anybody seen him? Yeah, most people have seen him. He claims to have a doctor's degree. He doesn't. Arnold Murray in the Shepherd's Chapel does, does seem a bit... Well, let me read the rest of this. The history of Arnold Murray in the Shepherd's Chapel is... A closely guarded secret, Diacon 2, a non-denominational group that has criticized Murray's teachings, comments, information about Arnold Murray and the Shepherd's Chapel does not seem a bit scarce considering how many television hours he has long requisitioned. He's on TV all the time, all over America. Requests for information from Shepherd's Chapel resulted for this author in chapel staff refusing to send any information beyond an audio tape by Murray entitled The Mark of the Beast. You'll see that to anybody, and he doesn't know anything about the mark or the beast. Requests for an interview by a reporter from Sacramento in 1989 were invariably refused with the excuse that Murray was unavailable for comment. Everything is very secretive about his ministry. He's a very big teacher, and I'm talking about as far as uh, reaching the nation. One possible reason for Murray's reticence to release biographical or historical information is the apparent misinformation circulated by the Shepherd's Chapel concerning Murray's alleged doctorate. Evangelical apologist William Alnor asserts that Murray falsely claims to have a doctorate degree from a popularly accredited university or seminary. This accusation is well substantiated by research. Oropesa notes that Murray claimed to receive a doctor from an individual named Roy Gillespie. <laughs> I don't know how you get a doctor from an individual. After writing a dissertation on the book of Daniel, I'd hate to read it, no evidence of such a dissertation was found in the National Union Catalog or through UMI microfilms, which is where they evidently they register these doctorate theses that they write, the primary source for copies of thesis and dissertations, the claim of receptionist for Shepherd's Chapel, an admittedly dubious source for official statements that Murray's dissertation was unavailable because it being revised is additionally problematic. Dissertations are not revised 
after being accepted by the author's dissertation committee, and the, she's saying it was revised. They say it's not revised when you get a doctorate from it. An Office of Graduate Studies at the conferring institution. Another receptionist. It is important to note that high-level officials at Shepherd's Chapel will not reveal any information about the organization. Office workers are thus frequently the only source of information concerning Shepherd's Chapel. Told countercult researcher Tony Pierce that Murray had attended Biola University, a Christian institution in Los Angeles. Biola officials note, however, there is no record of anyone named Arnold Murray having attended that school. Now, first of all, he's a liar. Now, here's his doctrine. Murray teaches numerous doctrines that are contrary to biblical Christianity, such as his denial of the Trinity. He does not believe in the Trinity. The Trini Trinity means three in one. There's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a he. When you see in Matthew, the first chapter, that Mary was with child of the Holy Ghost, Holy is an adjective. All adjectives have to carry the same gender as the noun ghost that they modify. Holy is masculine gender. That is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Father is a person. The Son is a person. And the word God means, it's the word theos in the Greek. It's the word Elohim in the Hebrew. It means a judge or magistrate. There are three persons that sit in the one position as the judge of the universe. And he preaches, he doesn't believe in the Trinity. He advocates British Israelism, which is racism. British Israelism is one idiotic, stupid doctrine. He also preaches the serpent seed doctrine, and that is that Eve and Satan had a sexual tryst or sexual affair in the garden, and that's how Cain was born. He is a stupid man. The Bible doesn't teach that. So he teaches the serpent seed doctrine. I'm not going to go into that. It's not true. I go into that in great length. British Israelism is just a, it's racism. I don't care how you slice it, it's racism. What they teach, what he teaches in British Israelism, here's what British Israelism is. It is that Great Britain is the true Israel, and it's dumb. And one verse or one concept destroys British Israelism. What they teach in British Israelism, they teach that when Israel has been a nation for 500 years, here's Israel, here's the Mediterranean Sea, here's Egypt down here, Egypt, Ethiopia down here. Here is what we call Lebanon. This is Israel. And here is Syria, right here. And here's Mesopotamia, or what we call Iraq. And then you got the Tigris and the Euphrates River. And here's the Persian Gulf. When Israel was carried away, and the northern Israel was carried away into captivity by Assyria in 722 B.C., Southern Judah was carried away into captivity in 586 B.C. by, by Babylon. Now, when Southern Judah was carried away into captivity, the last king of Southern Judah, this is where British Israelism comes from. This is what the Worldwide Church of God teaches, Herbert W. Armstrong, and this is what this imbecile teaches it's Arnold Murray it is if you're a black man and you watch Arnold Murray and you put any faith in him you're very foolish because he is a racist here's how he's a racist he says that when Zedekiah who's the last king of southern Judah down here last king southern Judah when his sons are brought before him, he had two sons, brought before his presence by Nebuchadnezzar and the commander of the Babylonian armies, and Nebuchadnezzar sent him over there to conquer southern Judah. 
For 500 years, Israel has gone after Baal in the grove. They haven't kept their treaty with Babylon, done what they wanted to do. So when they were carried away over to Babylon, Zedekiah's sons were brought before him, and Nebuchadnezzar, the commander of, of Nebuchadnezzar, said, take a last look at your sons. This is the last you'll see of them. And they killed his sons before his very eyes, and then they punched out Zedekiah's eyes, put him in, in, uh, put him in chains, and carried him off into captivity into Babylon. Well, British Israelism says that Zedekiah's, and there's nowhere in Scripture that says this, British Israelism says that Jeremiah took Zedekiah's daughters over to England over here. Here's Ireland here. And here's the coast of France. Here's Spain down here, Spain. British Israelism says Jeremiah took Zedekiah's daughters, daughters, over to England and established the throne of England with Zedekiah's daughters. First of all, God never passed the throne through daughters ever. It's passed through sons. And they just ignore this. That's why, you remember over in Genesis, the 38th chapter, that Tamar, Tamar seduces Judah, her father-in-law, pretends to be a harlot, so that she can keep the seed of Judah going because the scepter will never depart from Judah. Remember when Athaliah, the daughter, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, marries Jehoram in southern Judah, and she decides she wants the throne for herself. So soon, soon as Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, her husband dies, she tries to kill all of her grandsons and all the seed royal of Israel, even all the children by, of Jehoram by any of his other wives, and she nearly succeeds, and God only retains one of them, Joash, and he continues the seed through this son. God only passed the, the throne through sons. Now, here's what they say. We know when you read the first chapter of Matthew that the kingdom was passed, the kingdom was continued down to Jesus through Jehoiakim. A contraction for Jehoiakim, a contraction is a short way of write, writing something, Jeconias. A contraction is like cannot. Instead of writing cannot, you write can't. Can't. That's a contraction. Jeconias is a contraction for Jehoiakim. And when you look at the lineage of Christ, the throne was passed down through the descendants of Jehoiakim, who was the nephew of Zedekiah, not Zedekiah, because Jehoiakim had been carried away into captivity in 597. In the second deportation, Zedekiah was destroyed. His eyes punched out. His sons killed before his very eyes in 586 B.C. So the kingdom wasn't passed through Zedekiah. It was passed. It certainly wasn't passed through Zedekiah's daughters. It was passed through Jehoiakim, not Zedekiah. The Bible says so. When Zedekiah was taken into captivity, oh, excuse me, Jehoiakim was taken into captivity. The last chapter of Jeremiah says that the king of Babylon raised up Jehoiakim and set him at his table. And Jehoiakim was, he had a place at the king's table in Babylon the rest of his life. And his lineage follows down to Christ being the king of the Jews. So the lineage goes from Jehoiakim down to Christ, not Zedekiah taking the daughters of Taking This is what they teach. It's moronic idiocy. And what they say, British Israelism, which is what Arnold Murray teaches and the Worldwide Church of God teaches, teaches that the daughters, even though God always made sure and maintained that there would be a son to pass the kingdom through, how can you pass it through daughters when daughters can't be kings? And Israel didn't have queens. When Athaliah assumed the throne of southern Judah, 
She wasn't the queen of southern Judah. She was the king. But God reserved Joash, and then when he got old enough, the high priest brings him out and says, I'm anointing Joash. God saved King Joash. And Athaliah is crying, treason, treachery. You're, you're, you're taking my kingdom. What an idiot she must have been. The kingdom was, they say the kingdom was passed to Zedekiah's daughters and that the throne of England, that the stone that the queen sets on is the stone that was in the wilderness that the water came out of when Moses struck the rock in the wilderness. Well, let's just say the stone is this big for the throne of the queen of England. It's going to take a stone bigger than that to feed to give drink to two and a half or three million people. It's going to have to be something that's like a river, isn't it? Well, here's what the British Israelism says. They say, how in the world they come up with this? It's, it's stupid. They say that the throne of England is the true throne of Israel. That's why it's called British Israelism. What about Jesus? What about down through Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim down through Zerubbabel, as you find it in the first chapter of Matthew, down to Jesus, the king of Israel? What about that? If you go with this, you've got to cancel out the first chapter of Matthew, don't you? It's, it's stupid doctrine. Arnold Murray teaches this. And they say, this is the real throne. Now, since when did God establish the throne? Now, if you notice... Zedekiah is of the tribe of Judah. Let me show you their, their reasoning. He's of the tribe of Judah, isn't he? Here's all the kings of Judah, David, Solomon, all the way down through here to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was of the tribe of Judah, but so was Jehoiakim. Well, he's of the tribe of Judah, and when they established the throne here, he says, then automatically England becomes... Ephraim. Now, how in the world can Ephraim be Judah? Huh? It's, it's dumb doctrine. And they'll come up and say, since Ephraim was the strongest between two brothers, twins, uh, not twins, excuse me, two brothers, the firstborn and the secondborn, that that makes the United States Manasseh. And that the United States is Manasseh. And when they started this British Israelism in the mid-1800s, Great Britain was the strongest nation in the world. Well, that's why they made Ephraim England in this British Israelism, since Ephraim was stronger than Manasseh. But wait a minute. Now, since the United States is stronger than England, does that make us Ephraim and then Manasseh? You understand what I just said? They applied Ephraim, but Ephraim and Manasseh are sons of Joseph, and Joseph is the 11th son of Jacob, and Joseph is not Judah. They take Judah and turn him into Ephraim and Manasseh. And they say, white Anglo-Saxons are the true Israel and if you're black or yellow or red, you can go to heaven, but you're going to be a second-class citizen when you get to heaven. You've got to sit on the back row. That's Arnold Murray's doctrine on British Israelism. That's the Worldwide Church of God's doctrine on British Israelism. It's full of holes. How men can come up with this stuff is just amazing. Let me read some more about You say, Jim... What are you doing exposing all these guys? I want to expose these people on TV across the country because I want you to know what these guys believe. They don't believe the Bible. They don't even study it. Murray and his followers deny the biblical doctrine of the Trinity that one God exists eternally in three persons. They instead teach modalism, the concept that the monotheistic God is a single person who acts through three different offices 
<clears throat> they're saying that Jesus on the cross is God the Father, and Jesus on the cross is God the Son, and Jesus on the cross is God the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus was on the cross, he, was, he wasn't actually saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was actually saying, Myself, myself, why have I forsaken me? That's what they've got. Let me give you some more of Arnold Murray's false doctrine. There's too many people call me and say, you like Arnold Murray because he'll, he'll get him a word out of Strong's Concordance. No, I'm not. Murray clarifies his conflation of deity when he states, Christ's spirit is holy, he is holy spirit. Since Murray does not believe that Jesus Christ is a person distinct from the other members of the Trinity, he cannot justifiably claim to believe that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. Oro Pisa, accurately, this is a fellow that did some research, observes that it is thus inconsistent for Murray to promote such a teaching and also say, a wise man never discusses the Trinity. That's the way he gets around it. A wise man never discusses the Trinity. That's a good excuse, isn't it? Pre-existence of humanity. Here's another one is his beliefs. That there's certain, this, this guy's crazy. And people watch him and they don't know he believes this stuff. Any more than they know Billy Graham has got all that stuff going on behind the scenes. You don't know. You better investigate people. Go, on the, go online, go on the internet and find out what these people believe and teach. Billy Graham approves of everybody in the world that can say Jesus with their lips. If all you can say is Jesus, oh, you're saved. <clears throat> if you say, do you believe in Jesus? Yeah. Well, you're saved. No, you're not. Murray and his followers believe that humans existed prior to living on earth. Now, we believe that God has preordained his family from the foundation of the world. He knew us in his mind. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And our names were written in the book of life before the foundation of the world because he knew who his people were. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Murray teaches in regard to Genesis 1.26. That's where he says, let us make man in our image. Male and female created he them. God spoke to Elohim, meaning God and his children. Let us make that man in our image. Which is to say, make it look in likeness that we are. Do you appear in your soul? Do you appear as your soul appeared in the world that, I, that was? I told you that God said in our image, our likeness, the Elohim were standing there. They were from before. He clarifies, we were always with God until we were born on earth. Now listen to this next paragraph. It's insane. The concept requires further examination, much like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. He goes along with the same beliefs they have. Murray and his followers believe that humans participated prior to their mortal existence on this earth in the rebellion in heaven described in Revelation 12, 7 through 8. Those good individuals who fought on the side of Michael are those who are, according to Ephesians 1 and 4, says, were chosen before the foundation of the world. What? Let me read that again. This is crazy. Those good individuals who fought on the side of Michael in Revelation 12 are those who, according to Ephesians 1 and 4, says were chosen before the foundation of the world. The ones who fought with Michael are the ones that are Ephesians 1 and 4. Paul tells the Ephesian church he had chosen us, me and you, in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us into the adoption of children, us, not them, those that fought with Michael, you know what you have to do to come up with something like this? You have to make up doctrine. Make up instruction. These individuals were predestined to salvation and thus were not cursed with free will. Those who fought on the side of Satan, however, received a free will with which to choose to reject God in this life. He had to make that up, didn't he? Yeah. According to the student of Murray, 95% of those who fought for Satan, which because they are not followers of Arnold Murray, include such individuals as this author and most readers of this profile will continue to worship Satan in his life. So I'm a Satan worshiper according to Arnold Murray because I'm going against his doctrine. Christian identity. He is into Christian identity. 
Christian identity, in case you didn't know, doesn't mean you're identified as a Christian. The Christian identity movement has a militant side and has a non-militant side. The militant side of Christian identity is skinheads, the Klan. If you believe in Christian identity, you're liable to go to a to some uh, fort up in Montana, to some they have they'll build up these big places of refuge, and that's where these guys will, they'll arm themselves with all kinds of guns, and you have the militant and the non-militant of Christian identity. You've got, there was this guy, uh, Peter, uh, Pete Peters, out of, we had a group of people that left Grace and Truth Ministries, started following the Christian identity movement, and one woman said, you preach just like Pete Peters. No, I do not. Pete Peters is a church of Christ. He's Christian identity. He believes in this, in British Israelism, and the skinheads that's got swastikas all over them and the Klan, they're, they're the militant Christian identity, and they believe in killing white people, like killing black people, killing Jews, killing anything that gets in their way as, as white pride. That's, Christ, that's the militant side. They have a non-militant side like Arnold Murray, like Pete Peters. They have these people that are, it's called a Christian identity movement. Go online and Google Christian identity, and you'll see a lot of these people associated you're liable to go to a compound in Arkansas. When you get there, you think you're with a bunch of good Christian people, and you get there and you see these guys with rifles, you see skinheads with, with swastikas on their forehead, and some of the people that left here, I just wondered, and they started following this Pete Peters and their Christian identity movement. You people are ignorant. Why don't you come to him and talk to me about it? Just people get dissatisfied with Jim Brown. I just want to be smart too. I think I'm going to come up with my own doctors. And they find the first thing that comes along and they're led away into this. Let me read something to you about the Christian identity. Just as the doctrine of pre-existence is integrally related in Mormon theology with racism, so the doctrine, they say that if you're black and you're not a white Anglo-Saxon and you haven't been established through the throne of Israel, to England and America, if you're black, you, you're a second-class citizen in heaven. Is that racism? Don't follow Arnold Murray. The guy's a lame brain. That's putting it mildly. Don't call him names. Can I call him children of hell? So the doctrine of pre-existence is used in Shepherd's Chapel theology as a foundation for racist opposition to ethnic Jews, and I might add blacks, Murray's doctrine, which is similar to Christian identity movement, contends that the Caucasians of Anglo-Saxon, Northern European descent, are, who are followers of Murray, are the ten lost tribes of Israel. Boy, he had to make that up, did he? and that Jews are descendants of the offspring of Satan and Eve, the remainder of this section will analyze the various components of the racist ideology of Shepherd's Chapel. Serpent Seed, a follower of Murray who writes under the pseudonym Bruiser, that's a good Christian, that's a good Christian ghostwriter's name, isn't it? Bruiser clearly summarized the Serpent Seed doctrine proclaimed by Murray and his students. The serpent seed doctrine consists of the belief that Satan personified as the serpent inseminated Eve with more than, than knowledge of good and evil, that his insemination of her was spiritual and physical, that the twins she carried to term were fathered by two different beings. Those weren't twins. Abel and Cain were not twins. Cain was conceived out of wedlock. If they'd have been conceived at the same time, they'd have both been illegitimate, and they would not have, and Abel would not have, his lineage wouldn't have been carried on by Seth in Genesis, the fifth chapter. And those of you who've been here know what I'm talking about. That the twins she carried to term were fathered by two different beings, that Abel was sired by Adam and Cain was sired by Satan. Who in the world ever told you that an archangel has the reproductive organs or the genitalia of a man. Where'd you get that? Angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can't reproduce. 
You can't even reproduce two different species of animal out here. What makes you think you can take a, an evil heavenly creature coming out of the heavens, cast the earth, and reproduce with him? You think he actually has human sperm in him? That is insanity. That Cain's progeny continued and associated at various times with the children of Adam throughout history, that Cain's progeny infiltrated. Most people don't know Arnold Murray believes this stuff. He's got a lot of followers that call me. Mingle with the Israelites. That the damning words of our Lord concerning the children of Satan, his parable of the tares, the repeated mention of the synagogue of Satan. Gosh. Synagogue of Satan is talking about Jewish synagogues who have halakha. <coughs> Does, isn't it? If you study with me on the halakha, it's not talking about there's a synagogue of Satan that's every Jew. No, that's people who practice twisting the word of God in the halakha. Point to more in spiritual allegory that the lineage of Satan was and is alive and well among the children of Israel of whom at present consist of both Jewish and Christian peoples. Many people who claim to be students of Murray without actually paying attention to his heretical teachings. You don't even know who you're following when you're following our own Murray. Goes into British Israelism. He believes that when you die, you're annihilated. Puff, you're gone. Ain't no hell. Arnold Murray is a wacko. Don't compare me to Arnold Murray because he uses a concordance. Besides that, concordance is the, that is just first grade. I've got all kinds of word study books. I use 10 volume set of Kittles. I use word study books, the International Dictionary of New Testament, the International Dictionary of Old Testament, which are five volumes apiece. I use all kinds of word study books. Besides that, I use scripture. This man is crazy. And then he talks about the Kenites being a, a... Murray is surprisingly open about the Jewish identity of the Kenites. The Kenites were descendants of Abraham after he married his second wife, Keturah, after the death of Sarah. They weren't a race of people that came out of Cain before, the foundation, before man. Murray is surprisingly open about the Jewish identity of the Kenites. He claims now, who stands... In Jerusalem today, the sons of Cain are those who will not accept Jesus Christ. The Kenites that founded a new nation starting in 1948. Oropisa notes that Murray calls the Kenites scum and makes the stereotypical racial allusion to the Jewish business person when he claims, if you want to get a Kenite upset, bother his money table. <laughs> Much like the Jehovah's Witness, Murray and his followers do not believe that individuals will suffer eternally in hell. Shepherd's Chapel teaches that the souls of unbelievers will be annihilated in the lake of Gehenna. Murray states, we know man can kill our earthly bodies, but only our Heavenly Father has the power to wipe out the existence of the soul. The Bible doesn't teach that. God's emotions are so much greater than you can ever imagine. And to roast one of his own children day and night, they're not his children, they're children of the devil, you idiot. To roast his own children day and night would be something only Satan could conceive of. That's because you don't believe in the sovereignty of God and he hates predestination. Murray prophesied that the Antichrist would appear by 1981. Uh -huh. Missed that, didn't he? Uh -huh. Lucifer was taken up, taken to the pit. Know from second chapter, second Thessalonians, that he should, shall soon return. The book of Daniel very clearly states that it shall happen before the year 1981. Well, you messed up there. You're a false teacher. You deserve to die, according to Deuteronomy 18. The prophecy was such a notable failure that even the Ontario consultants on religious tolerance note that Murray, an anti-Trinitarian adherent to Christian identity, made this failed prophecy. And according to the Old Testament, he had to die. One wrong thing. If the thing does not come to pass in all of this pre Look over here in Genesis, the third chapter. All of this pre, these people living before, these Kenites living before Adam and the, and the predestinated ones who fought with Michael, that's bull. This guy's, he's an idiot. Look here in chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 20. Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Eve means the mother of something else. When you have 
Christmas Eve, it means the mother of Christmas. When they had, on Friday, they had Sabbath Eve, it meant the mother of the Sabbath. Eve means the mother of all living. Now, how can Eve be the mother of all living when there was Kenites going around that were here before the foundation of the world? He doesn't even pay any attention to what the Bible says. He's just like those charismatics that say, God wants you to have everything you want. I saw Jesus the other night. saw somebody on TV last night, and they were talking about these appearances of Jesus. Oh, it's Paul Crouch talking about Jesus is appearing to the Muslims all over the world in person. Jesus said, if anyone says, lo, here, there, he's in the secret chamber. He's out here in, the Utah, in Utah in his chamber in the Mormon temple, and they're talking to him. Jesus said they're lying. The Mormons are lying. If Paul Crouch says Muslims all over the world are seeing Jesus in person, Jesus said, if they say I'm here or there, believe it not, he's in the desert, go not forth, because the next time the world sees me, it'll be as the lightning shines from the east to the west. Nobody's having personal audiences and personal appearances of Jesus. Jesus himself said so. They have to make that up just like Earl Murray makes his stuff up, and they don't even bother to look and see that Jesus said, if anyone says they're seeing me, that's not true. If your grandmother says she talked to Jesus one night by her bed, she took a little too much NyQuil that night. <laughs> yeah, maybe a little drink, to, a little wine to put her to sleep. She's having hallucinations. I can't believe preachers are making up doctrine. And you know who believes them? I was going to get into them tonight. I'm going to get into it next week. The people who believe these guys are the simple You'll find that word all through the book of Proverbs, patha. Patha. Patha means you've got an open mind like a child, and anything anybody says, you just let it in because you like what you're hearing. It makes you feel good. You can take a little kid and take it aside and convince it of nearly anything. And he'll run to his mom and say, Mom, is that true? Is that right? He said, Daddy wasn't my daddy. These guys, we got a world full of liars. And people say, Jim Brown, who do you think you are to call all these people liars? I am not anybody. I'm trying to tell you that the Bible says that they're lying. Billy Graham lies. Charles Stanley lies. Kenneth Copeland lies. Fred Price lies. Creflo Dollar lies, T.D. Jakes lies, Paul Crouch lies, R.W. Schambach lies, Jerry Savelle lies, Jesse DePanis is a liar. All these guys are liars. The guy at Second Baptist Church, Ed Young, in Houston, he's got two huge churches. Somebody said he flies from one to the other in a helicopter. Ed Young is a jerk. He lies. He's a free will, shallow minded man. I mean, I watch him to see what he's going to say, going, God, you idiot. I sit there and call the TV screen names when I watch these guys. You, I'll sit there in a room by myself. Mary's back there in the bed sleeping. And I say, you dumbbell, you fool. And that's what they are. This is the doctrine of the devil because the world is wanting to appeal to people so they can have all this stuff and all these accolades and all this dirt. Give me some awards. Give me applause. Somebody needs to expose them. I don't know anybody that's willing to do this. I'm going to expose them as much as I can. I'm going to document this stuff. I'll get through this and, and get back to Ecclesiastes and Solomon trying to seek and have everything he wanted and him being the king of the demons, the king of the genies, the head of the genies and the demons and wanting to distribute fortunes to himself and learning that he couldn't have what he wanted, and he said it's all vanity and vexation of spirit, and he found out the truth as he grew older. But America is under a siege. The world is under a siege of false teachers. I don't know of a man in America that I believe is really trying with all his heart to tell all the truth all the time to everybody, and that's what I'm trying to do. You have to do it without reservation. You've got to do it so objectively. You don't care who gets mad, who burns your house down, who steals your car. You, have, you can't care about anything. And God has to put that in a man's heart. If he don't put it in your heart, 
you won't be willing to do it. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I have never been so tired of these preachers in my life. They know nothing about your precious word, your wonderful words of life. Crush us under your hand and cause us to be willing to seek truth and not this dirt that's around us. Cause us to be willing to crucify the flesh regardless of the conditions, of the ramifications, Lord. Strengthen the flock. God will praise you for everything. Give you glory for all things. Lead us to your elect. Open up many doors for the ministry. And Lord, I will preach these truths. We'll praise you for all things in Christ's name. Amen. At least you know what British Israelism is, don't you? It's a very popular doctrine going through a lot of the churches. You've probably never heard a whole lot of the false doctrines that's out here. They've got all kinds of doctrines that are false. Huh? What are you doing there? Father, what's going on? I found the title to the car. Did you? It's over here. It's, it's a clear title. I don't, I'm too tired to even look at it. But you got it. I'm going to give it to you. So, uh, Where's the car? It's over at Don's house. Over at where? Over at uh, Don, by my neighbor. What's he going to do with it? Uh, he's he's going to he's gonna fix it. Is it? Yeah. Well, good. Good. I got the battery over there in it. And uh, he's going to... Uh, we were supposed to start on that. I've been, uh, just hadn't seen it. Okay. But uh, well, check, I'll try to check him off the ball. So tell him to holler at me or I'll call okay. him or something. Okay. What, do you know his number? Mm -mm. Oh. I don't get it. I don't, I don't know. He, he's he's calling and leaving on my my mansion machine. Mm -hmm. he, he just lives across the street from me. So okay. I just go when I catch him. Most time I catch okay. him, you know, driving. Okay. But yeah, I got that. Excuse okay. me. Okay. Well, just tell him to let me know. Well, he's, he uh, he works he works too. Okay. He just does this on the side. It's not. Okay. Yeah, but he okay. has his own shop. So uh, when he gets when he gets it going, I'll let you know. Okay. I appreciate you, Robert. I love you, brother. You doing okay? Yeah. Doing good. Just tired. Oh, me too. I'm tired of the world. I'm worn out. When I get tired, I get to where I really don't care what people think.